So you're very welcome, everybody, to the next episode of Paving the Way Home. I'm delighted to be joined by another speaker this week from the United States, Devin Shat, who is um, uh, blind to the father of St. Joseph, the, the website fathersofstjoseph.org. Uh, Devin is a husband, a father, uh, an author, a speaker, uh, a, a man of many talents. Devin, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me on. Thank you so much. Um, if, if you don't mind me asking, Devin, what part of the United States are you living in? I live in the Midwest. So I live about two hours west of Chicago along the Mississippi River in Iowa. Oh, oh beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, regarding your family, how many children have you, Devin? We have five daughters. I'm surrounded by women. That's beautiful. I have, uh, I have three daughters, so uh, I'm, uh, <laughs> I, I'm getting there. Yeah, the, it's just surrounded <laughs> by them all. Um, Devin, thank you so much for joining us this evening because I know you're such a such a, a busy man. So giving of your time for us, this is fantastic. And I'd like to thank as well Father uh, Nida Reardon, who was the one who, was put, who put us in contact with one another. Um, Devin, in the last few months, we have been talking about doing, um, the last couple of months, doing this podcast regarding St. Joseph. And in the meantime, Pope Francis, on the 8th of December, proclaimed a year of St. Joseph. So from the 8th of December, 2020, to the 8th of December, uh, 2021, to mark the 150th anniversary of uh, St. Joseph, Joseph is patron of the Universal Church. Um, you obviously have a massive, massive devotion to St. Joseph. Can I ask how, how that came about? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I was really actually wrestling with my vocation. Um, I think, you know, growing up as a very prideful man, uh, very arrogant, very interested in selfish ambitions. I wanted to be wealthy, <laughs> you know, wanted to maybe be famous. I don't think I really wanted to be famous, but at least, you know, have that prestige that comes with wealth um, and maybe do something impactful. But uh, along the way, you know, I, I, I married my wife, Kim, and then approximately five years into the marriage, our third daughter, Anna Marie, was conceived. And uh, approximately six months into the pregnancy. Well, actually there's a long story there, but basically Kim had a, had to give birth to Anna Marie three months premature. And it was an emergency C-section. Uh, Anna Marie made it through that uh, amazingly well. She spent a month in the neonatal intensive care unit where they were able to develop her lungs and her digestive system. And in the process, uh, after that month, she came home but in five days, she contracted a cold RSV, which attacks premature infants' lungs, and it can really kill them. And so we took her back to the hospital and readmitted her to the pediatric unit, which the nurses were not capable of taking care of a baby that small. Anna Marie, literally her leg was like the size of my index finger. I mean, she was so tiny and she was just so vulnerable. And through nurse neglect, uh, 10 hours of apnea, she suffered what's a hypoxic event. Not enough oxygen was transmitted to her brain. And so they medevaced her out on life support to a children's hospital a couple hours away. But by the time she arrived, she suffered three clinical death experiences and permanent brain injury. And today she's confined to a wheelchair. In fact, yesterday we celebrated her 20, 20th birthday, which is fantastic. Um, but we do everything for her. Um, from bathing her, changing her diapers to, you know, feeding her everything. But at that time, we really didn't know what we had. And Anna Marie is fighting for a life on life support. And at that time, my wife suffered close to what would be a nervous breakdown. And I was involved in ministry. I just had a conversion. So I was on fire for the Lord. Uh, and I was starting my own business. So I was very busy. I was very much outside the home. And she said, I just need you to come home and be a husband and a father. And that was very difficult for me because I was a man of the world. I was a man who, you know, even in ministry, I wanted to be out there. I wanted to, you know, in a sense, wield the sword of the word, as St. Paul talks about. And I saw fatherhood as a second rate vocation. And, but nevertheless, I decided to go home and get involved and, and be a, try to be the best husband, the best father that I knew how to be, which wasn't. I didn't have very much knowledge, but I just saw fatherhood as kind of something that happens to you, not something you choose. And a friend of mine, I think, noticed that I was languishing. I was suffering in my faith. And so he paid for me to go on a trip to Medjugorje with him. And mm -hmm. while we were over there, um, I had several experiences, but one of them 
was where I met Nancy, Father Yozo's interpreter. And she's an amazing woman, if you've ever met Nancy. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I was talking with Nancy about just about this massive burning desire to serve the Lord. Like I had this hunger and I didn't know what to do with it. And she said, are you married? And I, and I said, yes, I'm married. Not because she wanted to marry me, but I think she thought I was supposed to be a priest. And I said, yes, I'm married. She said, do you have children? And I said, yes, I have three. And she said, go home and be St. Joseph. And I just, I, I'm like, St. Joseph, you know, you mean the guy who in the stained glass windows is bald. He looks like he's about 150 years old. Uh, he has no virility. Uh, he carries lilies around. I mean, he works at a flower shop. I, I don't, I don't think I'm interested, but nevertheless, I went home and I asked the blessed mother to begin to introduce me to this just man. And it was over the course of, I would say four years, you know, I basically, I, I took my attic, I had an old attic that was you know, unfinished. And I took that attic and I turned it into my chapel and I would pray and I would just wait on the Lord. And it was during the next four years, it was almost as though I was on download, just receiving almost like scripture verses and things that applied to Joseph and then connecting the dots. And then I started putting it down in writing. And then over those four years, I composed what's now Joseph's Way, The Call to Fatherly Greatness. It's a four-volume set um, that compares St. Joseph to the patriarchs. And it was comparing him to the patriarchs, seeing the patriarchs, you know, like I think Matthew says, you know, a good, a good scholar, he, he takes out of his storehouse that which is old and which is new. And so in St. Joseph, I was able to tap into that storehouse of those Old Testament patriarchs and how they prefigured St. Joseph. Both, both positively and negatively, but then I was able to see that light of patriarch shine in a sense on him and how he raised the son of God and how he's a husband to the blessed mother. And it began to change my life. And one of the big lessons that really came out of it for me was Joseph's silence. Joseph was not a man eager to be known by the world. He wasn't a man of selfish ambition. He wasn't a man who needed popularity in order to affirm him, to give him his identity. He was a son of David. He knew who he was. He knew he was a son of God in a certain sense. And that was enough. And for me, that really changed me. So over those years, I literally buried myself in my chapel and began to become a better father and a better husband and focus on that. And it was amazing because I, what I didn't expect in this process was I made a dis definite decision to be hidden, like St. Joseph, little silent hidden, as Father Paul Siegel would say, you know, to be like St. Joseph. And then I shared the manuscript with a friend, and he shared the manuscript with somebody without me knowing as a publicist. And that publicist shared the manuscript with Ignatius Press without me knowing. And then Ignatius Press calls me and asks if they can publish my book. And I was like, well, we started this little chapter, this confraternity of Father St. Joseph. So I don't think I'm ready to sell the copyrights. And they said, oh, that's okay. We'll distribute it. It was just unbelievable. So, and then it became a bestseller, Ignatius bestseller. And kind of like the rest is sort of history. You know, it's just, a, it was just an amazing set of events that led to it that's that's amazing like as you were speaking there you know when we we're talking there earlier on as well we we're talking about you know saint joseph you know if we haven't studied saint joseph the first thing that comes to mind is that's you know that guy in the the ball the guy in the stained glass window who has never there's never a word recorded from him in, in scripture uh he his 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 role in, in in the scriptures and the gospels is really really minimal. Yet this is a role model for all men. Um, like it was as you say, the silence was his his witness to silence was unbelievable. Today maybe in today's world, you know, we can get caught up so much in materialism where you know we kind of might think that as the role of a of a husband or or a father is you know. You know, and rightly so, you know, put food on the table, put a roof over our heads. But once that's done, you know, the rest of like raising the children and that sometimes maybe can be put to the to the mothers uh, and that. But this guy, like he he lived on, on the edge, so to speak, in terms of being a, a problem. Like even, for example, I guess when, um, you know, like when, when he's asked to get up, go to Egypt, um, didn't 
probably didn't know anyone in that country, didn't know how he was going to, uh, how he was going to feed his family, how he was going to, to pay the bills, whatever it was, but yet knew that this is what God wanted of him. So doing that, picked up his family, protected them and, and went along the way like that. That courage, even that simple example alone is wow when you, when you meditate on it. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, when I meditate on it, like just what, you, what you're saying right there, we could talk for hours about that. There, there's so much there. I, I, my mind goes in several different directions, but I think the, the main thing that we can learn from what you just said, which is powerful, and the life of St. Joseph, the key to being a spiritual warrior, which is what he was, he was the guardian of the Redeemer. He was, as Pope John Paul II would call him, he was he was the spiritual leader, if you will, of the Holy Family. That's He was head of the Holy Family. He was given that role by God. He was the father of the family. But what does it take to be a great leader? What does it take to be a great warrior? See, Joseph had the secret. It's silence. Because in silence, God's... The, we can discern God's voice, his mission, his vision, his plan for our lives. See, silence leads to obedience, and obedience leads to action, and that action leads to glory. So if we're not embracing the silence, because that we're not going to be obedient, and that word obedient in Latin is ob adire, which means toward audible, toward a, a audio, voice, sound. And so when we enter the silence, we're waiting on God. We're trusting that he's going to speak in some way, shape, or form. We're, we're, we're attempting to discern his voice in our souls. And then he gives us some kind of inclination, some kind of prompting in our conscience that calls us to action. And then we have to rise obedient and, obediently in action, which St. Joseph did time and time again. And in Pope Francis's letter, his apostolic letter on St. Joseph, that comes through. Pope Francis focuses on this this haste and this urge and this, this um, instant response of St. Joseph at all those commands that God gave him. That's what it takes to be a mighty warrior of God. And that's what we see in St. Joseph. That's amazing. As you, as you speak there, as you're talking uh, about the silence uh, and prayer and the haste, the urge, um, the instant uh, action there, um, as you're talking, like you're saying, wow, what a couple he and Mary made because we're thinking like oh, so many times in scripture we hear like Mary pondered these things in her heart. So the silence was was key for her to, to, to chew on the word of God. But then obviously with the uh, with, with the Annunciation, her first thing was to get up and go in haste to the mountain. Her instant response was uh, to get up and go to the to the person she knew was in need, which is uh, Elizabeth. So just I hadn't thought of that before. But as you were speaking there, I was like, wow, what a couple, what a couple they make. And in their in their silent witness, what what witnesses they were then to uh, to the child Jesus uh, in, in his youth. Yeah, I think that which is just something that just came to me as you're as you're speaking there is that uh, many times in the scriptures, you know, it says that like you said, Mary arose and went. Joseph arose from the dream and did what the angel commanded him to do. And that idea of arising, it, it we can. Uh, almost say it's a mini resurrection. It's a foreshadowing of the resurrection. So every time we arise and do what God commands us to do, it's a mini resurrection. We're preparing the way for our own resurrection. We will rise from the earth as when God raises us from the dead. And so for those who do not arise and do what God has commanded them to do, there is no ultimate resurrection for them. For those who do rise in, uh, according to the command of the Lord and do as he commands, there's a resurrection, a glorious resurrection. And so, yeah, we see in Joseph and Mary, Mary and Joseph, we see this union of wills, this incredible desire to carry out God's will from the beginning. And it's very interesting because, man, I could go so deep right now, Brian, but uh, it, just let's say in Joseph and Mary, we see a new Genesis taking place. And in fact, Matthew is specific in this. He says, these are the origins of Jesus Christ. And that word is Genesis. And then he goes on to recount this type of new Adam and this type of new Eve. And he says, between, you know, the creation of Adam and I think it was the Babylonian exile, 14 generations, or between that and David, and then between David and the Babylonian exile, 14 generations, and then between 
them returning and Jesus is coming 14 generations. What is that? Those three 14s are six sevens, six sevens. And that is symbolic of the six days of creation. And here it is on this seventh day, so to speak, the seventh generation, this new Adam, a type of a new Adam and new Eve, they, through their union of wills to God, this is so essential. Jesus was not born out of wedlock. He was not conceived out of wedlock. He was conceived within a marriage. Joseph and Mary were betrothed, which is the first stage of Jewish marriage. God chose that Jesus would be conceived within a holy matrimony. And so what this means is they are like the new Adam and the new Eve. And they, by their union of wills to one another, this consent to remain virgins, but yet this self-giving to God, in a sense, they drew down the word made flesh in their family, in their marriage. And Saint Paul, jo Pope John Paul II says in Guardian Redeemer that it was a fruitfulness altogether new, a fruitfulness of the Holy Spirit in their marriage. That is amazing. And so they, and so let's make it in practical terms. What does this mean for us? Because they're so beyond us. They became an icon of the Holy Trinity. So wow. Mary and Joseph were a, a reflection, a reliving, a revealing of the Holy Trinity. And what that means for us, that self-giving love, the Holy Trinity, that means we can look to this Holy Family and become like them. And that we could talk about that all day, what that means. But I think that's what we see in them. We see in the Holy Family, this prototype, this archetype, this way to live, that's actually going to bring us not worldly happiness, but the true happiness that only God can offer. That's, an, that, that's astounding. Just, just, just thinking there. Um, when Paul Francis, um, you know, released words that this was going to be here of St. Of St. Joseph, there was one particular uh, section from his letter that really stood out to me. Uh, and what I said was, he said, St. Joseph concretely expressed his fatherhood by making an offering of himself in love, a love placed at the service of the Messiah who was growing to maturity in his home. And the reason that stood out was that that sacrifice, that offering of himself. And, you know, in our marriages, uh, both of us are husbands, both of us are fathers, and we are called to to you know, we're called to give of ourselves completely for our spouse and, uh, and, and and to lead our spouse, to lead our children to heaven. But that sometimes that concept can be you know it can be lost or, or misunderstood by by people. But that that sacrifice, that's what Saint Joseph did, just completely self giving sacrifice of himself in love. I just thought that was absolutely astounding. Yeah, I, he I think in that. It might be in a different spot in that letter. I'm not sure. But if it is in that spot, it, he's quoting Paul the Sixth, And Paul the Sixth talks about how St. Joseph is this superhuman oblation. I just love that. This superhuman oblation that his life was so superhuman in the sense that he was willing to sacrifice himself for the greater cause. And, and that word sacrifice in the Latin uh, is two words, sacer. And, and facere, to make sacred. So facere is to make, sacere is sacred. So sacrifice is to make something sacred. So St. Joseph sacrificed his life. He set it aside for God so that he, and I think this is beautiful. This is what our children are missing today. They do not understand what sacrificial love is. And so if they do not see us as men, initiating self-sacrifice because that's stamped in our body and this is we could get into the whole, whole theology of the body thing but but men our essence really deep down our essence how we're different than women is that we're called to take the first step in the dance you know we're called to set the pace of self-giving love we're called to initiate self-giving love it does not mean we're better it doesn't mean that we're better dancers it doesn't mean that we're better lovers it doesn't mean that we're better at sacrifice or prayer or holier than our wives it means, though, that the demand f f on us is to initiate self-giving love. And let's be frank, in, in the sexual act, in sexual intercourse, if a man does not initiate and penetrate, there is no life. There is no intercourse. There is no love. And, and so that's what we're talking about here is that in the man's body is stamped this reality that he's called to go forth from himself 
and initiate self-sacrificial love. And I love what Pope Francis says in the, in the episodic letter in that sacrifice is not enough. It must be self-giving love. It must be a gift of self. And so what I think he's getting at, and he's kind of big on this, is that it can't be rigid, grit your teeth, pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of religion. You know, it can't, it can't just be of laws and rigorism and, and just, you know, this punishing myself and mortification kind of sacrifice. It must be an act of love, a superhuman oblation, as, as Paul VI says of St. Joseph. And so I think that we could, man, we could dive deeply into the whole topic of sacrifice in St. Joseph on many levels, but that silence, this is important, silence leads to obedience, and that obedience is expressed in sacrifice. Yeah, so that sacrificial love is, the point to me there are unbelievable, because they're, they're challenging to me as a husband, as a father, um, like even the way you speak there, that that's I find out it, it, it's challenging in a good way because I need to be challenged. Um, but we live in a world, we live in a world that's very much asking us to look back inwards on me, 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 and I the whole time. Um, and and that and that you look after yourself kind of a thing, or you look after your own feelings, or or kind of thing. I've, I've put it before anyone else, but that concept of that self-sacrificial love that um that joseph gave to mary and mary you know he gave to joseph and that jesus gave for every single one of us it is uh it, it's mind-blowing absolutely mind-blowing um on your website father is saint joseph.org fathers is saint joseph.org uh you had a you had a very interesting article that i enjoyed and um you have many articles there and i recommend anyone to go on and look at them uh, but one of it was saint joseph a sign of contradiction yeah, so I think that um, one of the reasons St. Joseph is a sign of contradiction, <clears throat> and this is so important, on his feast day, March 19th, the solemnity, the, the an opening antiphon for the Mass is taken from Luke chapter 12, I think verse 42, maybe, somewhere in there. And it says, who is the wise and faithful steward who's placed over his master's house to give them food in their due season? And it's interesting that the church uh, highlights this passage because in this passage, there is a word that is only used 12 times in the New Testament, in the Greek, and it's only used by Christ. 10 times referring to himself, but twice referring to the father of the family. And it's the steward of the house or the good men of the house. It's in, in the Greek, it's oiko despates. It, in, in the translation of Latin, it's pater familias the father of the family. And so if you dig in to Luke 12, it's an outline for the, the duty, if you will, the charism of the oiko despates, the, the pater familias, the father of the house. So what is it? If he knew when the thief was coming, he would, he would stand awake. He would he'd be awake and he would protect his family. That's the first thing. He's a protector. Um, who, he gives them food in their due season. He's a provider. OK, so he's wise and he's faithful. That means he receives the commands from God and he transmits them. He implements them in his life. So he's a priest. He's a sacrificial priest. And then not only that, but he's placed over the master's house. So he is he is, in a sense, the octoritas. He has authority, which is totally a sign of contradiction to our Marxist, socialistic, anti-father culture, anti-Trinitarian culture. So. So here it is, you've got priest, protector, provider, leader, and then servant. And, and obviously, if he's not a servant, he's not a leader. If he's not a leader, he's not a true servant. Because we, we actually, we have to follow Christ. And the way we follow Christ is by leading our family to him. And so this is the sign of contradiction for our times. The human father who actually believes in Jesus Christ, who's the exercises his office as the bishop of his home, as St. Augustine says. St. Augustine uh, had a homily where he was speaking and he addressed the men in his audience. He says, you men, exercise my office in your home. That is the bishop, to be a bishop. And so a bishop is a priest. He's the high priest of his home. And what does a priest do? A priest offers sacrifice. And what type of sacrifice do we offer? The sacrifice of self. 
And so this is the sign of contradiction. And that's why I think Pope Francis's Year of St. Joseph and the Apostolic Letter, without him probably even knowing what he's doing, in a sense, he's guided by the Holy Spirit, because here it is, right on the heels of this Marxist, socialistic uprising, Antifa in our country, you know, Black Lives Matter, all of them, what's the single component, the thread? No dad, no father, no head of the family, you know, never even mentioned. And then Pope Francis calls it a year of St. Joseph. And well, what, and then the apostolic letter, unlike any of his predecessors, all the predecessors in their writings, they use adjectives to couch St. Joseph's fatherhood. Uh, putative father, legal father, adopted father, supposed father, virginal father. That's not in the documents, but you know, mm. some people refer to him that. And what does Pope Francis do? Father. <laughs> he's, he's, he's Jesus's father. So what he's saying in this document without being explicit, well, even though he kind of is, is that the greatest type of fatherhood is spiritual fatherhood, to beget spiritual life to another, and it exceeds biological father you know, exponentially. It's it's incredible. So now St. Joseph is being raised up, not just as father of the church, patron of church, but father for everybody because he was the father of Christ in a real, tangible, concrete way. And then, you know, Pope Francis outlines them, beloved, tender, you know, obedient, accepting, all of those, you know, working father, you know, in the shadows, the hidden father. But the point here is that why is this happening now? Because our world needs fathers. Fathers in the image of God the Father, and that's what Saint Joseph was, and that's why he's a sign of contradiction. <clears throat> One of the a, a very interesting aspect of Saint Joseph that a lot of time is very much overlooked is his treatment or his view of women. And the reason I say that is, you know, we see the man when you know, okay, Our Lady comes to saying, um, in the middle of their betrothal to say that, um, you know, that she has she has conceived and she's going to have a child. Now, I know the, there's no definitive reason by the, uh, teaching by the church on the reason St. Joseph um, went to divorce Mary. I was listening to a Dominican speak last weekend uh, at Mass here in Cork, and he's, he gave three reasons. He said it, it, was, it was fascinating. He said, some people say that St. Joseph was uh, in, in, so, in such awe at what was happening and felt unworthy. He, he had to back off. Others said, oh, gosh, what's after happening? Whatever um, it was. But it, 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 the main reason, I guess, um, he, he didn't want to go public was he did not want uh, Our Lady um, to be to be hurt or harmed in any way by society, by the rules of the law, uh, and that and that that act alone just showed the the honor he had for a lady, but also how um how he viewed women. And and, and the reason I the reason I say that is um you know growing up uh, there, there was there was a particular person in the parish I grew up uh, and when I was an auto server he was in the uh uh, Saxony one day and he made, made a, a very interesting point he said uh, you always know it was something like he said you, you, uh, you'll always know how how real a man is by the way he treats women um, and and that's that's something that sticks out to me when uh, I, I, I think of St. Joseph here in this capacity. Mm, absolutely yes we, we become men true men by living in relationship to women and and you know, a woman cannot make a man a man. Only God can make a man a man. But a God created woman to help to forge us. Any man who's married understands this and to forge us into men. But yes, you're right. I mean, St. Joseph, first of all, there's no way that he suspected Mary of adultery. And there's many reasons for this. One, if he did suspect Mary of adultery, then he's judging her. And that would be unjust. But we know that Zedek, just, that's what St. Joseph was. He was a just man, Zedek in, in the Hebrew. So he couldn't have judged Mary. That was the first thing. We know he couldn't have judged Mary. Second, he knew Mary better than anyone else. He knew her ignorant dignity, her beauty, her holiness, all of that. He encountered, and that's why he loved her incredibly. And so 
there is no way just on the personal level that he would have ever dared to think that she would have committed adultery. And St. Bernard and St. Thomas Aquinas also say what your priest said, that Joseph, when discovering Mary pregnant, he was in a sense in awe, but found himself to be so unworthy of the mystery that was taking place in Mary that he decided to withdraw from her. But I think, you know, the reality is, is that Joseph, on one hand, did not believe Mary had committed adultery. But on the other hand, he couldn't explain it, really. He, he just ha didn't have the wherewithal. Maybe, and yes, he knew the scriptures well, because a just man meditates on the law of the Lord both day and night. So he knew Isaiah 7, 14, that the virgin shall give birth to a child. He knew that Uzzah, when he stretched forth his hand to the ark, that he was smote and killed on the spot. He understood all that. But to put it all together and say, I know for sure that this is what is happening, that, that might be a little bit too much. We do, my belief is that he did believe something supernatural is happening. He just couldn't explain it. And therefore, therefore, he could not expose her to the law hmm. because he couldn't defend her. And so instead of, okay, I can't defend her before the law, before the Pharisees and the, and the righteous, the synagogue priests. But what I can do is I can shelter her. I can hide her. And that is justice because he's, he's, he's protecting the innocent. And that's what makes St. Joseph so just is that he didn't condemn Mary. And on the other hand, he didn't presume that he could defend her in, the, in a sense of a legal battle. And so he leaves it up to God. And this is so beautiful because when Joseph... Uh, it says that when he decided to separate himself from Mary and he pondered on these things, the Greek word for ponder is enthomeme, which means there was, it's where we get the word thumos, the deep spirit of man. But in this case, that deep spirit, it means that it was grieving. And so St. Joseph, it wasn't like he was just you know, slacking on the job and he went back and had a sandwich and a beer and, you know, took a nap. You know, I mean, St. Joseph was grieving over the fact that the love of his life, he was unworthy of. That's what's going on. He felt unworthy of this, this, this beautiful virgin who is now conceiving and he doesn't really understand why. Perhaps it's a fulfillment of Isaiah 7, 14. And so he's grieving. And what can we learn from St. Joseph in this? All of us we have moments in our life where we grieve, where we become uh, despairing, almost discouraged in angst. And, and, and think about guys who lust. I mean, what's going on with lust? Uh, a guy sees a very beautiful airbrushed woman on the internet. And then there's this, a, a, a passion rises up with him. He feels like he has to act on it. And if he has any virtue in him, he, he chooses not to act on it. And then he goes through a grieving process of not being able to have her. It's just reality. He grieves that he can't have that beauty, but he offers it up to God. And, and that's a warped, that's a disordered kind of, but in a sense, it ends up becoming very good if he overcomes that. Well, St. Joseph, we can relate to him, whether it's financial duress or relational duress in our marriage or the angst of to try to defeat lust in our heart. Enthomeme, we grieve in our heart, but what does St. Joseph do? He enters the dark night of silence. He presents his grievance in silence to the Lord. Not one word of his prayer is ever recorded. And then he waits and he waits. And I love that about St. Joseph. That's the key to St. Joseph is that he waits on the Lord and all those who wait on the Lord and trust in the Lord shall not be put to shame as the Psalm tells us. I think it's Psalm 43. And so Joseph waits on the Lord. And this is the key. What does that say about Joseph? Patience. He, he is a patient man. And that word patience in the Greek is hupomene. And, and part of that, mene, means to remain and patience under. So he remains under the trial. He refuses to flee from it. He refuses to just give up. But he, enthomeme, he grieves, but he takes that grievance to the Lord. He waits on the Lord under the trial, the stress, and then the Lord gives him the command. And this is a key for all of us, a four-step process. You, you, you enter the silence, you present your grievance to the Lord, and then you wait. And then when you discern what he wants you to do, you rise and do it immediately. That's astounding. That's, uh, that, is, that is really amazing. We see here with, uh, with St. Joseph, 
And Pope Francis in that letter said, St. Joseph, he teaches his son to do the will of the father. That, that was really striking. But so here we have, we have Our Lady conceived out of sin. You had Jesus, who is the Messiah. And yet God has entrusted the welfare of the, uh, of the Son of God to this, to this mortal being, to this, to this human being who, you know, who um, no doubt, like he, he wasn't conceived without sin. So no doubt he had his faults, he had his failings. And yet God entrusted this man, Jesus, to this man, entrusted Our Lady to this man, and also entrusted St. Joseph, to, uh, like we just said, to, to teach Jesus to do the will of the Father. What does, and it kind of links back to what you said a while ago about, you know, what, what's happening with Antifa, Black Lives Matter, everything. Why are fathers then essential to God's plan? What is God telling us uh, in that through St. Joseph? Oh, man. Well, okay. So statistically, just if we look at things statistically, um, where do we begin? Um, they say that uh, 90% of youths in prison come from fatherless homes. Children from fatherless homes are uh, five to six times more likely to commit suicide, um, 32 times more likely to run away from home. Children from dual parent households uh, who have a strained relationship with their father are 68% more likely to use drugs, alcohol. Um, dads have twice as much influence as mom in helping their teens keep from having premarital sex. Um, if the mother is the first to convert to Christianity in the family, there's a 17, one seven, 17% 17 probability that the family will follow. If the father is the first to convert to Christianity, there's a 93% chance, probability that the family will follow. It's, it's incredible. So just from a practical standpoint, statistical standpoint fathers are absolutely essential and necessary but then we get into theologically why well if you look at gosh my mind is just racing with so many things here um okay let's first of all move back the old testament the one of the last prophecies in the old testament god came, god spoke to the prophet malachi and he says in chapter 4 verse 6 in that end, before that great and terrible day, I will turn the hearts of fathers toward their children and the hearts of children toward their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a curse. So what's God saying? He's saying that the key, the recipe to, in a sense, saving the world, to, be, to keeping the world safe and in harmony and peace is when fathers actually turn their loving gaze. They become the face, the voice, the touch of the heavenly father to their children. Their children will not only turn their gaze to their earthly father, but trusting they have his love, they will trust all the more that they have the heavenly father's love. And that's what makes the beginnings of a great family is when you have a father who's an icon of God, the father. And why is this important? Because God is not just father. God is not just Holy Spirit. God is not just the word. God is unity in distinction. Three distinct persons who are essentially and eternally one, you know, they're one the same. And so what that means is they're literally for all eternity, these three distinct persons are so self-giving, they're literally in one another, giving themselves to one another for all eternity. And so then God in Genesis says, let us, and there you see the Trinitarian clue, let us make man in our image and likeness. And so how does he make man? Distinction, male, female, not male, male, not female, female, not homo, but hetero. He makes them male and female, and then he calls them to unit, unity, be fruitful and multiply. And then through this, what happens? There's a third, and then they become a family. And this family, through distinction, unity, and fruitfulness, because these are the marks of the Trinity, three distinct persons. They live in the unity of the Holy Spirit. And then there's this fruitfulness of life and love and bliss and rapture and ecstasy and creativity and power that is unleashed on humanity, right? Well, God makes us in that image through distinction. There's unity in the married couple, and then there's fruitfulness in life. And so when the father is, he plants his seed and goes his merry way, uh, there is no fostering of that Trinitarian communion. And that's why we have the problems in our world today, because if you look at every false ide ideology, at the core of it, it's anti-Trinitarian. 
So let's just let's just look at some of the sexual sins or the sexual ideologies. Masturbation. It's there's no distinction. It's just me. No unity. No fruitfulness. Uh, um, abortion. There's distinction. Unity. They kill the fruitfulness. Contraception. There's distinction. There's almost unity, but it's blocked. Definitely no fruitfulness. Homosexual intercourse. There is no distinction. Therefore, there's no real unity. There's a, there's no fruitfulness. You know, and you can go on and on. You can even look at communism. You know, all the same. No distinction. Uniformity rather than unity. No fruitfulness. It goes on and on. And you can really look at the world's ideologies and say, does it bear the three marks of the Trinity or not? And that's how we discover the truth of life and where peace and joy and 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 a, a, a fulfilled life comes from. And we see that in the Holy Family with St. Joseph, who, who I, I deem him as guardian of the Trinity in the family, guardian of the mystery of the Trinity in the family. And that's what we're all called to do. We see in St. Joseph the courage, the courage of the man in, you know, being told in the dream, he, to protect, in order to protect his family, he needs to get up and go to Egypt. Uh, and he just gets up uh, and he does it. And there was a, cur- a there was just this courage and bravery and humility and obedience uh, in this act, in this this crazy situation that was beyond society at the time with all these children being killed and all that. Today, we're having a bit of a crazy situation uh, in our world today with the coronavirus, with this pandemic. And, uh, pandemic. and as we speak here on uh, Tuesday, the 22nd of December, uh, Ireland has just been notified that we're going into another uh, level five lockdown again. Um, and for a lot of people, it's causing such distress um, and anxiety and hardship. How would St. Joseph address this situation, would you think? <laughs> wow, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, hmm, how would he address this situation? <laughs> well, I think that first of all, we need to look at Joseph's priorities. He was commanded to protect the child and his mother. And so in today's society with the COVID pandemic, that ultimately for every father is his job. And it's becoming very difficult for some men because they're not able to provide for their families because their jobs are being taken from them because of these silly shutdowns. Um, But I think that at the heart of it, we've got to reinvest ourselves. I think in, in a, you know, what do they say? They say that it, with every curse, there's a blessing, right? And so we can look at the COVID curse and, the, and these lockdowns, but then we can see a silver lining, I guess, or a blessing. And what is that? That fathers now can turn their hearts with more focus upon their family, upon their wife, upon their children, and begin to live out St. Joseph's four pillars, which is to embrace silence, to embrace the woman, to embrace the child, embrace their charitable authority. And when we can have this time, so to speak, when the external voices and all the busyness, you know, they say in in English, busy, B-U-S-Y is burden under Satan's yoke. You know, when we cut out all that busyness, suddenly we have time to recalibrate and refocus on what we're supposed to do. And interestingly enough, I mean, you you talk about St. Joseph uh, when he fled to Egypt with the family and you talk about that is an that is an allegory for fatherhood. So here you have Herod, who's a symbol of Satan, who wants to devour the child and his mother. That's Revelation 12. Satan, the Nahash, the beast, he's waiting for the woman to give birth so that he can devour the child and then kill the mother. That's what he wants to do still yet to this day, not only Jesus and Mary, but to us. And so that's lived out. Satan through Herod is trying to kill Jesus. And then the angel gives him the command to flee and take the child and the mother to a foreign land, exile. Now, listen to this. This is so powerful because when does Joseph do it? By night, the dark night of fatherhood. The world doesn't even see it. It's seemingly insignificant, ordinary, so common. And yet, St. Joseph, he takes the ordinary and makes it extraordinary. He takes the insignificant and makes it significant. He takes the common vocation of fatherhood and makes it so uncommon, it becomes supernatural almost. And so what happens? He protects the child and the mother by night. In a foreign land, Egypt, he survives. And that's what every human father 
following the example of St. Joseph, he is to call to live the dark night of fatherhood, where at, in, in this hidden silence, as Jesus says in Matthew 6, 6, your father who is in secret, imitate your father who is in secret. We fathers were literally called to imitate the father who is in secret by living this hidden dark night of fatherhood where we protect the mother and the child. And what does that mean? It means we go home and we be St. Joseph. We actually invest ourselves into building that domestic church in our family with prayer, family time, fun, but becoming that spiritual leader, praying before meals, having din din family dinner, every night of the week, if you can, you know, I mean, all these practical things, develop your own prayer life, hidden sacrifice each and every day, on and on. But, you know, there's 30, I, in this uh, book, Kustos, I just, uh, I just, this is coming out this year. It's a consecration to St. Joseph, 33 days where you're biblically walking with St. Joseph, but it's not just learning things about St. Joseph. There's uh, actually a seven, seven stages to this where you have spiritual practices. And the idea here is you begin in each of these stages to ramp up your spiritual life. And it's not just personal transformation, but it's relational transformation with your wife, with your children, with your work, with God. And so the whole point is, is that it, we need to be integrated. And the most difficult job I believe in this world is being a father and a mother. Hmm. And I mean, I can, you know, I, I've been a graphic designer for 20 years. You know, I ran my own business for 20 years. I thought that was difficult. No, there's nothing as difficult as being a father and a husband, nothing, nothing. And, and I don't care if I'm building retaining walls or I'm on the, you know, on the job site, building a house or, or whatever I'm doing, you know what, there's nothing as difficult as being a husband and a father. And so in Kustos, what we do is we outline the 33 practices that kind of ramp up that allow us to actually become the priest of our family to live a life like St. Joseph. You know, as you're speaking there, as you're talking about, um, in some ways, just the manliness, the, the, the manning up, like I, I just think, you know, for, for any of us who are sports fans or who've, who've played sport league, we put so much emphasis into the, into the gym, into fitness, into, you know, the ultimate goal, which is if, if it's in a sport is to get yourself ready to go out in that championship field, whatever it is. And the end goal is to win whatever it is. And yet when uh, at times when it comes to our own maybe vocations, or even if we're, even if we're uh, single uh, and maybe we're allowing ourselves to get caught up in whatever vices, whether it's pornography or drugs or whatever it is, uh, we're, we're letting ourselves down, and, and and just as you're speaking there about that that that, that consecration, it just really speaks about why we need why uh, us as men in particular we need a, a devotion to Saint Joseph to be to 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 be praying to be to to him to be asking to intercede for us to be to be even though we don't have much on his life, but yet to be studying uh, the virtues of Saint Joseph because this was. This was a man. This was the man, the 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 men of all men, um, and, and that's who we need to, to to copy, really. Yeah, I mean, it's so amazing. I have these conversations with men all across the nation, if not, you know, some around the world, and there's a common theme that uh, so many of them feel like men or boys trapped in men's bodies, and the reason that so many of us feel as though we're boys trapped in men's bodies is because we can be winning on the court, we can be winning on the field, we can be winning in the job place, but if we're not winning at home, we know and our family knows that we're failing. And that is like so, uh, dis there's a disquiet in our soul. We know we're not doing something right. And so my thing is, is like, hey, if you're not doing it at home, don't do it abroad. You know, like if you're not speaking to your kids about Christ, don't go around the world speaking about Christ. If you're not, if you're not having a Bible study with your family, then don't have a Bible study in the church. You know, and I know that sounds harsh, but I'm just saying that's like kind of hypocrisy. You know, it's like this one spiritual director said to me, um, I was going to confession to him. And he said, we Hispanics, we have a phrase and it is do not become a street lamp for your house to go dark. And what he's saying there is, is don't be this light of Christ on the street corners and preaching the gospel and, you know, doing all these things in the name of Christ. But yet you're ignoring your family. As we finish up here, Devin, really, really appreciate you, uh, you coming on, on board tonight to, to chat to us about this. It's been absolutely fantastic. For any of our viewers who want to, um, who, who just want to see 
uh, get a hold of any of your books or or, or listen to your talks? And how do, how do they how do they find you? Yeah. So if you go to Fathers of St Joseph.org, you'll see our website there, and we've laid out. It's we just revamped it, so we lay out the plan for men, which consists of five moving pieces, and one of them actually is a free ebook, which we uh, give men a PDF um, that they can sign up for called The Path. And the Path is a beautiful little free handbook that outlines a father's spirituality based on Saint Joseph. It's very powerful. Um, but very easy, very simplistic terms. But you can go to fathersbeststjoseph.org, download that. But then you'll see the plan, the five components there. We've got 40 Days to Fatherly Greatness, um, which is a 40-day video series. Uh, we've got Custos, then um, The Meaning and Mystery of Man, which is another book. But this is like, this is, this talk about sign of contradiction. This is it. Um, I mean, it's just crazy. But then we've got other resources. We've and we're coming out with a YouTube channel, The Catholic Father, and uh, we'll be posting videos over time there. And so there's a lot coming out in this next year of Saint Joseph. So um, you can go there. You can find it all there. Um, and eventually there'll be more. That's fantastic. Listen, uh, Devin, thank you for for all that you're doing in. Uh, and just helping to to nourish and spread and build on on the faith of so many so many people out there and look uh, at this as we're approaching Christmas I wish you and uh, and your family a real blessed and holy and happy Christmas and uh, uh, and, and we just ask God to 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 bless you your family your ministry uh, and we thank you so much for 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 for, for giving of your time uh, to to speak with us this evening uh, Devin you as well thank you Merry Christmas to you thank you God bless. God bless.